that we won't we, we want to make build tech that that that's unstoppable by a government when we say government we don't mean the u.s government prosecuting cases against truly bad guys what we mean is around the world totalitarian governments all around the world that uh use money to persecute people that's what we mean because i watched in sterling off they they use similar language against him and they said see he he had an intent to help criminals who want to uh, want to sell drugs. But that's not what that language means, really. That language means totalitarian governments around the world, Russia, China, Venezuela, North Korea, who use money to persecute and hurt people. Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet, a trustless open source wallet that gives you the keys to your crypto. Invoice, donate, and trade your Monero with peace of mind, peace of cake. And by Stealthy X an instant exchange where privacy is a top concern. Go to StealthyX.io to instantly exchange between Monero and 450 plus assets without having to create an account or register and with no limits. Making StealthyX a simple way to purchase Monero with crypto anonymously. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever. By typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your Monero.com or Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews J.W. Verrett, a practicing lawyer and law professor at George Mason University. J.W. discusses his role as an expert witness in the Roman Sterlinov trial, where he argued that Sterlinov could not have allegedly ran Bitcoin fog. JW and Doug also talk about the implications of the government's recent overreach related to privacy and cryptocurrency technology by exploring the indictments against Tornado Cash and Samurai Wallet. Hear about who in the U.S. Congress are allies in the movement to normalize privacy and the potential hope Monero provides to resist increasing government infringement on privacy. Monero Talk starts now. All right, JW, what's going on, man? Good morning, good morning. Good morning, Doug. Good to be here. Good to be here. So what's going on? I feel, I feel like uh, it's gotten a little more dark and stormy since you were last on. I keep thinking about that song by Warren Zephon, Send Lawyers Guns and Money. Um, you know, send lawyers guns and privacy coins, man, because the shit has hit the fan. Uh, we we are definitely on the front lines, experiencing it firsthand. Yeah, I know you you very much been on the first lines. You were you were part of that trial. Uh, is there anything you could tell us about that now that it's over? Yeah, man. Um, U.S. versus Sterling off. You know, I really got to thank you, Doug, because I I learned about uh, the trial in a great Monero Talk podcast that where you had Tor Eklund and Mike Hassard on. And I'm walking my dogs one night, listening to those guys talking about this case. And I said, shit, I got to get involved in this trial because this is, uh, this, they're putting an innocent man in jail. So I reached out to them and they said, yeah, we could use you. You know, uh, one of the things I do for, for a living, it, part of it's law professor, banking, securities, law stuff. Uh, though I'm a libertarian, so I, I hate everything I teach about. And then um, I do some forensic accounting stuff to help help in litigation so i reached out to them i said can i help in that way they said yes you're in you're in definitely we're not sure we could pay you but you're in so i said all right fine let's do it um and i got qualified as an expert in the in the trial uh for six hours the prosecutors grilled me to try to disqualify me as, as an expert but i, I got in and then it, then i got to know roman sterling office spent about 30 hours with him in prison really got to know this kid and dug through every little piece of his financial life. I mean, he's innocent. He's innocent. And and I went from just being skeptical from what I heard on your show, what I read in the indictments, what I read in the evidence, to spending 30 hours with this kid and just every piece of his financial life. Imagine if someone ever went over every piece of your financial life over the last 10 years of your life in prison, brought the documents with them, asked hard questions about why this pattern, why that pattern. Well, that was when I sublet an apartment. That was when this was not... It was just obvious to me. He is innocent. He did not run Bitcoin fog. Um, so I got to know him, and it, when he when he was found guilty, it was like it punched in the gut. I mean, it was hard. 
It sucked. It was a sucky day. And it, yeah. the courtroom was full with, you know, 30 DOJ people all kind of looking like the looking like the wolf uh, who just walked in the hen house. Um, uh, it was a tough day. And and what kind of role did you did you play in the trial as a as an expert witness? What were you kind of really there there to do? Well, two things really. The main thing was my main focus was the government had a forensic accountant, uh, someone from one of the big four accounting firms who was on loan to the IRS, which sounds like a miserable career, but yes. um, uh, they. The, the government's thesis was, the government's argument was, um, Roman Sterlingov's transfers, he, he had a number, a record of transfers from Bitcoin Fog to his KYC Kraken account, amounting to about $1.8 million worth of Bitcoin. And the government said, well, obviously that's fees from running Bitcoin Fog. And Roman said, no. And he testified in the stand. He said, no. I was early to Bitcoin. I bought Bitcoin back in 2011. In 2010, and if you're buying Bitcoin in 2010 and 2011, it's hard not to be worth a couple million dollars worth of Bitcoin, right? This is this is back around the time of Bitcoin Pizza Day. Yeah. Um, he said, "I used Bitcoin Fog because that's what everybody did for privacy. I used Bitcoin Fog," and he said, "Then I I would send it back to when I, eventually I wanted to start selling it because there was some price action in 2014, 2015." I wanted to sell it on Crack It because that was a lot easier than peer to peer. So I sent some of my Bitcoin that was at addresses that had been mixed at Fog to get personal privacy because I was going to meetups and buying and selling with people and I didn't want to get a hit with some kind of wrench attack. I sent it eventually to Crack It because I didn't have anything to hide from Crack It. Um, so I went in to, to, to say a few things. First, I did an analysis of Bitcoin Fog. I said, look, the government says. Uh, based on the government's own numbers and the chain analysis numbers, which that's a big if, but even if you accept those numbers about how big Bitcoin fog was, the amount of Bitcoin going through Bitcoin fog, there's a million Bitcoin that went through fog, they said in total. The fees were about 2 to 3%, variable between 2 and 3% for, as a mixing fee. So I said, just on that basis, you're talking about 24,000, 36,000 Bitcoin that the operator of Bitcoin Falk would have earned. That's a lot of Bitcoin. How do you price that? Well, it depends on what day you price. It's what day the operator, the hypothetical operator Falk is selling, right? Mm -hmm. If they're selling early, it's low. If they're selling late, that's a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. Let's do somewhere in the middle and I put up a chart for the jury. If you have a convention of assume they hold for one year after earning the fee, two years after earning the fee, three years after earning the fee, what would the operator of fog earn? By professional opinion, is it would have been a couple hundred million dollars in fees. Mm -hmm. And I said, my graph is logically consistent with testimony from someone else who ran another mixer, Helix, Larry Harmon, who who pled guilty to running he the Helix mixer. He said on the stand, same numbers that I was giving for whoever ran fog, Larry Harmon said. I made about $200 million from running Helix. That's what he said on the stand. Now, Helix was a smaller mixer than Fog. Helix operated after Fog started, closed down before Fog closed down, and ran less Bitcoin through Helix. So I said, ladies and gentlemen, the jury, whoever ran Fog, based on my calculations of the government's own numbers of the fees, and held up by comparison to Mr. Harmon, it's kind of a market comparison, this person would have would have earned hundreds of millions of dollars. Now let's look at Roman Sterlingoff. I've been through his finances with a fine-tooth comb. This kid never spent more than $50,000 a year on himself, except he bought a Tesla, except he, that was his one extravagance over 12 years of his life. He bought a Tesla with Bitcoin. He bought a Tesla. Otherwise, he spent about 50 k a year on himself. He did do it in a weird way that you're not used to as a jury. Yes, he used gift cards because he would send his Bitcoin to, to, to get gift cards. But he also used... KYC gift cards for all of this spending uh, when there were options to use non-KYC gift cards. So let's jump on the jury. If he he had to have earned, if he ran Fog, as the government believes, he had to have earned hundreds of millions of dollars, and yet the government never shows him worth 
more than 1.8 million, never spending more than 50K a year on himself. His finances and everything in the government's records don't show anything more than that. My forensic investigation of him for 30 hours in prison don't show more than that. Where is the missing Bitcoin? The mystery of the missing Bitcoin. We put it up in a giant PowerPoint. It was like a title of a Sherlock Holmes story, Professor Verrett and the Mystery of the Missing Bitcoin. That's what we put as the title, right? And I just tried to just simplify this for the jury. And I just don't see how I was connect- convicted. That was my little piece of this. There were other pieces mm-hmm. of it that 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 Eklund and Hassard put together. That was my piece of it. That and also just saying, this is this is one of the frustrating things about this case. The FBI, they had an FBI agent up there who was a kid a couple years out of college. And the government said, he's a money laundering expert. Uh, he wasn't a money laundering expert. But anyway, what he would do is he would look at patterns of transactions that were complicated. And for no other reason than that they were complicated, he would point to them and he would say, that's consistent with money laundering. And I would be like, it's also consistent with how things work in crypto. Because if you're like me, like if you were to pull up my wallets, the wallets on my phone right now, you would see a pattern of buy an NFT, then it goes to a privacy tool, then it goes over here to play around with some DeFi stuff, then it goes here, then it goes there. You would see these same spider webs of stuff that they put up on charts with Roman. And it's like normal in crypto, but it's it's if you're the average person who works at the post office in the District of Columbia... You're like, what is all this complicated stuff? And an FBI agent just told me this complicated web of transactions is consistent with money laundering. Therefore, it must be money laundering. Um, so I was there to try to counteract some of that. But it's it's hard. And you see on the front lines the advantage the government gets when they bring a conspiracy to commit money laundering case. They get to just say, you know, your finances are weird and complicated. Therefore, must be money laundering. Um and it it was they it had such a Kafka like element to it. I get I get excited about this trial, but um, but that was my role. That was my role. What, kind of what what's what, what would you say is the the big takeaway from a legal perspective um, of kind of what this what this means moving forward? What comes out of this trial? How has it kind of changed the scene? Yeah, you know, I I think that. That um, it's it's a tough one, man. I, I think he. I was, mean, it's it, it's it's a win. It's a win for chain analysis, right? It's a win for the the DOJ in in how they use chain analysis, right? Um, they interpreted it that way after the trial, but you know, I'll say this: um, Tor, so Tor Eklund and Mike Hassett fought like lions. I mean, I've never seen lawyers like this. Every motion, every objection was like the last stand in the trial for them. And they frustrated the... You can tell how good a defense lawyer is by how frustrated the prosecutors are. And they were frustrated all the time. They are the lawyers I would use if I was in trouble. Uh, And one of the things they were successful at doing was putting such a spotlight on chain analysis tracing that when chain analysis actually testified... They qualified their testimony a lot. And they said, whoa, 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 whoa. We're not attributing any Bitcoin addresses to Roman Sterling at all. All we're doing, all we're doing is just tracing links and clustering addresses and claiming they're the same entity, Bitcoin flow. That's all we're doing. We're not attributing ownership of an illicit address, illicit proceeds address to Roman Sterling at all. Whoa, 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 we're not. So they backed off a ton, when, to which Tor said, wait, you're not attributing any illicit funds or proceeds to that man right there? But what are you doing here? What's the point of you being here? So they qualified their testimony a lot, and yet they spun it as a win for chain analysis. But in the end, chain analysis wasn't as relevant to the case because of all the fights that Tor put on the front end of pretrial motion. Mm. Yeah. But I have to but tell it- you, I have, I have to tell you, Monero Talk came up in the case. Oh yeah, yeah. Tell tell me this story. This is this is a little scary. So, uh, one of the things they tried to do to discredit me was use my association with Zcash and use the fact that I appeared on Manero Talk. Um, so the prosecutor asked me how I heard about the case, and I had to tell Monsi. So I said, 
uh, you know, I listened to listened to a podcast with the attorneys in the case, and then I reached out because when I read the indictment, it was clear to me that that man is innocent. Objection! Objection! Boom! 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 And the judge says, "You can't say that. You can't say that." So that's so. Uh, so the prosecutor says, "Podcasts, huh? Is that the Monero Talk podcast?" And he <laughs> looks at everybody else in the courtroom like, "Oh no!" no, no. And I was like, yeah, yeah, it's a great, but you could definitely, uh, it's a great podcast about privacy in a, in a particular community. Um, it's cool. And he has, he's like, you sit on the Zcash Foundation board, a, a, a board that supports a cryptocurrency that can't be traced. <laughs> yes, because we believe that <laughs> privacy is normal. And I, I said, I looked to the jury, I looked to the jury in the eye and I said, we believe that privacy is normal. The thing about cryptocurrency is this without some privacy enabling technology, Cryptocurrency transactions are for the whole world to see. So it's like your bank account, your checking account is public to the entire world. And they all looked at me for the first time in the trial and said, oh, we didn't think of that. Maybe privacy is OK. You know, you could see the wheels turning a little bit, but it wasn't enough, man. It wasn't enough. I, I, I'm, I'm, la- I'm laughing here, but it's it's freaking terrifying. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. Wh- where are we headed, right? So, so the the the, go- the government uh, appears to be currently winning, uh, you know, this fight. Um, obviously, cryptos like Monero and Zcash, they're 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 built to be unstoppable. But the fact of the matter is, there's there's a lot of shrapnel that's 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 uh, that's yeah. that's being spread out there right now, and uh, there, there's real victims. So uh, you know, tornado cash is one. I mean, um, the Bitcoin fog thing is one one thing, and, and in that case, uh, you know, the, the the tech itself that was used there was clearly not decentralized. That was a centralized mixer. Um, you know, who, who was running it, we don't know, but it was clear. It was clearly a, a centralized service. But now, now we're seeing things get, go a step further with this indictment of Samurai. Uh, which is not analogous to the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin fog mixer at all, uh, built in a way where there's no uh, the, the samurai never held custody of anybody's of anybody's crypto. Effectively, you know, it's 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 not a mixer; it's a coin join. A lot of technical differences, but the government just doesn't care. And now they lopped it all in, into one, and they're going after samurai. What is what is your what is your take on this? They're being accused of money laundering as well, right? Conspiracy to commit money laundering, and uh, for you know, uh, I guess the second charge is operating without a money money license, right? Money transfer license. Conspiracy to operate a unlicensed conspiracy. Money. Yeah, they're both right, conspiracy. right. Conspiracy is is the government operating on video game god mode, uh, <laughs> basically. You know. Um, uh, I like the dis- the technical description that Seth for privacy has. Uh, I think it was on your show about about how the coordinator worked that it was akin to like an email service where people would think of it like people emailing each other. Hey, you want to sign with me? Yes, you want to sign, with-? but in a way that's a lot more efficient and uh, can't be uh, that's that's uh, anonymous. Um, yeah, man, it, it's it's obviously a stretch, and you you. you um, it should be read in conjunction with the government's latest response to the tornado cash uh, yes. indictment where um, the government advances a theory that we can we can get you on a money transmitter or conspiracy to operate an unlicensed money transmitter even if your service is not is decentralized and doesn't take custody which is I mean, it's like saying, you know, Fenson gave you guidance and they said it was okay, but ha ha ha, we're the DOJ, we get to put you in jail anyway. Um, the DOJ's position in, in, in Tornado Cash and the theory they're advancing in Samurai have been like widely criticized by a community of crypto lawyers who are former Treasury and DOJ and SEC people. So this is people who used to be prosecutors people who used to work at Treasury FinCEN who say, oh my God, what? No, that's not, that's a terrible, uh, terrible abuse of power. Um, Hopefully that tells us something about what a judge will do with it, particularly with all the good amicus work 
that is going into this. So in the tornado cash case, you know, people don't want to touch money laundering. They think, oh, I don't want to be associated with, but Blockchain Association came in with an awesome amicus brief and support. DeFi Education Fund, Coin Center, God bless Coin Center. They're fighting for all of our lives here. Um, so those amicus briefs were powerful. I expect there's going to be an amicus fight uh, to support the samurai guys too. Uh, so, you know, it, when I when when legit amicus briefs come in from you know like people that judge respects lawyers that judge respects and institutions, maybe that helps take a step back um, and fight some of this kind of government privacy is. You know, privacy means you must be doing something bad. Um, I don't know. Anyway, the ambicus stuff is going to be important. But look, yeah, the government's position now is that is they basically ripped up the 2019 FinCEN guidance and said, we can come after you uh, if a bad guy uses your tech, I guess is the rule now. Right. Like, what, what currently is a money service business? Well, what is the I mean, current? Anything. De- de- it's a short hop from there to saying... Uh, we take it back. Uh, an unhosted wallet is a money transmitter, right? Mm-hmm. Crazy. Can, can can you give us any insight into how how this is happening behind the scenes? I mean, FinCEN came out with these these these, these rules or this guidance in twenty nineteen that that clearly defined what a what a money service business was. They've been completely ignored, ripped up. Um, how is that like, uh, are the, are these people kind of talking to each other, aware of each other? I mean, what's the point of guidance if it's not, if it effectively is, isn't guiding anything? Can you give us any insight into how that, that works in, in, in the federal government? I mean, um, uh, what, what, what do you know? Tell us, I mean, what, what, what's really going on behind the scenes? I mean, at the end of the day, is it just government doing whatever it wants to do and, yeah, I don't know, man. I I uh, I don't have a, very much interact. The only interaction, I mean, so I I um, the only interaction with I have with DOJ is is as a witness for criminal defendants, so they don't tell me anything. You know, um, I did have one interaction with one prosecutor from DOJ at a um, at a Stanford blockchain conference. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the prosecutors at DOJ who led the case against Welcome to Video that was profiled in Tracers in the Dark, uh, which is a great case. I mean, for, you know, Welcome to Video is an evil, some evil shit. And the people buying child sexual, sexual abuse material from Welcome to Video were all just, they bought, they put, they, you know, they buy Bitcoin, they crack it, and then they transfer it from the KYC account to Welcome to Video. So it wasn't even really that complicated investigation. They just, it just, they just subpoenaed the um, crypto exchanges uh, for the addresses that sent to that to that thing once they found it. Um, but so this guy, but this some of the prosecutors, you know, they use chain analysis in some cases where you think that's a good case, and I'm glad that case happened. But the prosecutors involved, the investigators involved, and chain analysis are all also involved in clear witch hunts against innocent people. Um, anyway, talk to this prosecutor a little bit, and. It was this weird experience of a room full of half, like, people like me and people who created the Julian Assange DAO and people who were building DarkFi, kind of that group, and, like, federal prosecutors and regulators in a privacy breakout session. And it was weird. It was like a civil war in there, man. Like, there was no common ground at all. But the DOJ prosecutor guy says, uh, says, okay, let's all agree as a beginning point that um, we don't, you know, we wish we could get rid of Monero and we don't want a Monero only world, right? So the other half of the room was like, I don't want to be foul on your show, but we were not nice to that. We did not agree to those terms of the discussion. Uh, and it was clear from him that like, if he could, if he could light Monero on fire, he would, but he doesn't feel like he can. That's why I think that layer ones like Zcash and Monero, like just the basic design is not at risk here from this. Um, I think they know that that building an L1 in a decentralized uh, open source way is nothing like the central entity that they're going after in, in these cases. Um, 
But the the future I see for for my own protocol, Zcash, is one where we hope to become programmable in a way that that eventually the, the day would come where people want to build something on top of it, uh, smart smart contracts on top of it. They can, and if that happens, those people will themselves need to think about what they're building. Um, what when, when you say the layer one? I mean, yeah, obviously. Uh... If it was last week, yeah, I would agree with you. It's 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 safe from from being under attack. But now we're we're seeing. Uh, I think it was just yesterday. Representative Sean Caston is proposing a bill to essentially um, has been what is it? Cryptocurrency it is tweet. Cryptocurrency has been used to finance terrorist attacks around the world, made possible by digital asset mixers. I'm introducing legislation to temporarily prohibit crypto mixers while we study the technology and how it is used for illicit purposes. So he he's proposing to temporarily ban crypto mixers. And I believe he, he calls out privacy coins in that bill as essentially being a crypto mixer. So he's proposing yeah. here we, to ban uh, layer one privacy coins. I Obviously, think, I think that the bill... It's a bad bill. I think what it does is it does a study of privacy coins. It bans mixers. I think that's what it does. Okay. I don't, that... see, it, I don't see it passing. It's a bad bill. We have to fight it. But it's a Democrat-only bill in the House. So, um, you know, I, I don't see it passing. But it's a it's a continued threat. And the delistings are a, are a threat. I mean, I just I hate that. Um, so you're right. There are still attack vectors uh, other than just going after the devs and calling them money launderers, right? There are lots of other attack vectors we have. Another one, too, is the um, cases against, like, whale big users. If you're too whale a user and too frequent a user of local Bitcoin or local Monero, sometimes they go after you and say you're an unlicensed money transmitter, which is another really scary attack vector that we can talk about a little bit. I'm sure you've probably seen those cases. Yeah, I've seen it. Have you seen that they shut down local or local Monero shut, sh- is shutting down? They are shutting down. Yeah, they they haven't given details as to why, uh, but I assume they feel like they're they're under the gun here and that they may be accused of, you know, whatever operating. Yeah. But even just for being a for being a large peer to peer transactor, the if the government can find you, they go after you. Um, and and here's the trick they do. Uh, I am sure part of the trick that they're doing. So to be an unlicensed money transmitter, you have to be operating a business for a profit. You, uh, they, they're, they're supposed to not go after you for just being a, an individual who's using you know money. Right. Um, so if you're using a platform, a, lo- a, a peer-to-peer kind of coordinating platform, and you're a whale user, you're regularly going in there, to like speculate or just to buy and sell for your personal use or to be a speculator. Um, you're not, you're never going to be doing that at the spot market price because the peer to peer platform is going to have just a wide spread, right? Cause it doesn't have like an Oracle or something. It's so, it's so rough and messy that that's going to be a huge spread to those transactions. So you'll be making a spread like, like there's no way to be a large regular user of a peer to peer platform and not kind of be a market maker. Like that's just, you can't avoid that. So the government will say, well, see, see, because of the spread, they must be making fees. Therefore it's a business. Um, and, and so, ah, it's just another attack vector. Yeah. I've, I've always, you know, something I've always put out there as a warning to people, uh, when you use things like local Monero, local Bitcoin, realize that you can't be using it as as a business right? as as to, yeah. to make money right it has to be that you're using it out of your own own personal need perhaps you're you know you're you're monero only and you you need to you're living off this stuff and you need to once in a while turn it into cash so that you can purchase certain things yeah but the moment they have evidence that you're using it as for purposes of running your own business where you're profiting off the trade uh, you're considering a money transmitter at that at that point, um, and really, that's just that's just their word against yours. I mean, and so if yeah. you're using it on a weekly basis, they'll have more evidence against you, perhaps, to say no, you're doing this as a business versus if you're using it seldom, right? I mean, yeah. Where do you where do you draw the line on that? And now and and now, I mean, uh, local Monero effectively is no longer going to even exist. Um, do we do we think 
it's like that's it's kind of the end of an era with with that concept in general of things like local Bitcoin, local Monero, that they just it's too too risky, too much of a gray area for them to safely exist without them being constructed in some kind of different way. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. One another thing to think about here is one of the theories that the government seems to be advancing in the the samurai case is because notice they just brought conspiracy charges. They didn't bring uh, the direct charges. So they brought two of the four they brought against Roman, but not two of the, they, they didn't say they're directly money laundering, directly money transmitters. They said they were in a conspiracy to do both of those things. So the government's theory seems to be that Whirlpool and the coordinator is the unlicensed money transmitter, is the, co- is the, is the money launderer of both. And then these guys are in a conspiracy with this thing, in a conspiracy with, with computer code. Um, we'll see if that theory holds up, but that's that's novel. That's new. I, I mean, I guess inspired. You conspired with the code. That's weird. All right, right, right. right. Yeah. Well, I guess a p- part of the conspiracy is the reason why it's a conspiracy charge too is because they, I guess, they don't have any di- direct evidence that they were um aware that it was being used to to quote unquote launder money right yeah that's part of like, it it's, the government tries to attribute they need to even to get the conspiracy charge they have to attribute criminal intent they've tried right. to do that with twitter posts twitter kind of shit posting that these guys were doing but in the indictment at least i haven't st- there's like general stuff that kind of jokes about oligarchs and stuff, but there's still nothing direct, like uh, nothing that directly shows knowledge of a specific set of criminal proceeds that are being laundered. So, right, they need to show that there was the the mens rea there, right? That they had the the will and the intent to actually yeah. go out and actively launder money or assist somebody in laundering money. And 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 I you know not not to belittle the money laundering charge, but the bigger the the more concerning one is the money service business charge because this is going to really now define what is a money service business, yeah. and if they're successful with this charge against samurai, like we're saying now, the the entire definition changes, right? And effectively, any any service that's dealing with crypto. Uh, even if they don't have, even if they're not uh, custodying the the cryptocurrency, will be considered a, considered a money service business if this case, if they're successful with these charges. Yeah, <clears throat> there's no real outer limit to what they're claiming, um, which is part of the reason why I, I, I just don't see that it can possibly survive. It won't necessarily help the defendants in Tornado Cash. Even if a judge comes back and says, whoa, 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 like you've thrown a bunch of stuff at the wall. Let me draw the lines here. Most of what you said doesn't apply. Let's hope that happens and that has precedent of everyone else. I mean, I hope to help the guy, the defendants in that case. But one of the things that might happen is the judge will draw a line and say, well, no, let's distinguish here. Um, because there are some facts in the tornado cash case that make it a little more messy uh, the 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 relayers and the torn tokens work to help facilitate the relayers, and you know it's like a the code is speech arguments at the center, but on the periphery there's some complicating factors, and so if the case outcome focuses on those kind of complicating factors, and we get some we might get some kind of a ruling from the judge that no, uh, you know you the the FinCEN guidance maybe still holds. I don't know. It could be kind of a messy outcome that has some partial wins for privacy. I just don't know. Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans. And if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, gratuitous, and Monero.
let's let's talk a little bit more about so the the layer one concept, right? So obviously we we've seen this coming coming down the pipe, right? That's that's why guys like me and you are, are more interested in, in layer one than yeah. building tools for things like Bitcoin that are inherently transparent. Uh, because by way of these tools, it's it's like you're you're opting in to 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 mix your mix your crypto, clean your crypto. You're taking some action um, to to uh, erase your your history, right? As opposed to the 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 tool being built into the protocol itself, so that things are private by default, fungible pr- by default. So there is no overt action that's being taken by users to erase their history. It's just people using this tool and every tra- transaction is equal to every other transaction. It's just fungible. You can't then accuse somebody of saying, hey, uh, you were trying to erase your, your, your history here. You were trying to wash your coins. No, you were just making a transaction. Um, what do, do you think? I mean, is that is that a... Are are we safe in that assumption that that will hold up in, in the U.S. that you know they they won't be able to ban that that you know the Constitution uh, eventually will will be looked at and respected? Do we think this is something that they'll attempt to do? Like we see with this legislation that was proposed yesterday, um, and then perhaps it goes to like the Supreme Court. I feel like I, I've asked you these things in the past, but. Now that we're a little further down the road, how do you potentially see these things playing out for for these layer one privacy coins? Um, so on the on the the first thing we talked about today, I I think that developers are safe who build an L one protocol uh, that just has privacy as a feature of the L one. Uh, they're just building Bitcoin or Ethereum just in a different way. So there's no central mixer, there's no custodial function, um, which should matter, despite the adjacent door and the FinCEN guidance. There are other threat vectors, um, like delistings, like banning financial institutions from touching something. Not that we need to, we need more threats, but let me let me tell you about a bill that's that has better chances of passing. That's even more of a threat than the Caston bill that you mentioned. Um, there's another bill from two Republican senators uh, that um, uh, that would do a couple of things, but one of them is they would give uh, the Treasury Department special measures authority to ban a particular type of transaction as, quote, of money laundering concern, and <clears throat> which could mean, which could mean, that Treasury could effectively say one day, privacy coins are used too often by bad guys, therefore no financial institution is allowed to touch it, which would include every uh, central um, c- a c- central exchange. Uh, they could do that. So it's a, it's I hate it because it's a... I've been fighting within the crypto community about this because so many people in the crypto community say... We need an alternative to Liz Warren's bills. We need some Republican alternative that's kind of national security, but it's like Elizabeth Warren light, and so it's not going to be as bad, and then we can say that we did something. And I say, first of all, you assume that we need to do something. Um, I'm not for Elizabeth Warren light, and that's what the, this bill's called the Enforce Act, the Enforce Act from Senator Tillis and um, uh, the senator from Tennessee, uh, Bill, I'm blanking on his last name right now. He was ambassador to Japan under Trump. Uh, anyway, Senator Tillis, it's called the Enforce Act. Keep an eye on it. Raise the alarm about it. Because to me, it's just Elizabeth Warren light, and we need to kill that thing too. I think I've asked you this in the past too. Uh, any insight or what's your theory as to who, who the puppet masters are behind the, these bills and these actions? We all know how things work, right? It's not Senator Warren sitting there thinking, I got to go after crypto. It's it's somebody who's telling her, go after crypto, go after crypto. It's it's the people that are putting the money in her pocket that are keeping her in that seat. 
um you know we, we know we know how how dc works you have you have the politicians and then you have the people behind the politicians how do we define this group these people who who are the puppet masters here that are pushing these initiatives forward in in your in your mind yeah it's there's a few different forces i think one of them is liz warren's ideology uh, I think she's she's decided that she's okay allying with traditional banks now. Uh, she made her case, she made her name beating up on them for a decade, and she's, she's now she's okay allying with them because you know the kind of the new left view of banks is let's ally with them, let's get the banks to subsidize the communities we like through the Community Reinvestment Act, so, which is basically like uh, affirmative action type lending. So that's a kind of an alliance between the new left and the banks. And as crypto comes up, if you're on the left and you see the potential to control people's lives with money uh, through taxation, through spending, through uh, through through um, full employment focused monetary policy, which is say just lacks monetary policy, then you see crypto as a threat to all that. And so I think ideologically, she's just opposed to crypto generally. And and um, financial privacy is also not something the left has any care for, which is weird because their ideology has always been so focused on privacy. And I think they had the moral high ground against the right in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, you know, in fighting for privacy. Um, but I don't know. When it comes to financial privacy, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa we just, uh, no, we, we should be able to trace everybody's money because ri- people might get rich. We don't want that. Um, so I think it's ideological with her, but she does have some, some common ground with the big banks. I think that's, that's fair. Uh, and it's also law enforcement, uh, the, the ratchet up of KYC AML, every bill ratchets it up, increases the reach of it. Uh, law enforcement just loves this tool, loves the ability to deputize the banks to kind of help them make their cases because they're lazy. And they don't care about the fact that this KYC AML system is like the compliance around it is so massive relative to the very small number of cases in which that information is actually useful in prosecutions. But they don't care. There's no cost limitation for them at all. Um, and I think they're the ones, for example, that are uh, that slipped in this special measure, this so dangerous special measures crypto banning authority in the Enforce Act draft that Senator Tillis is pushing uh, for crypto. So, but you know what? Uh, We've, we've, um, we've got an, we've got allies. We've got allies. And, you know, our community is not necessarily always a lot allied with like uh, the, the groups in the blockchain association that are kind of TradFi partnered and stuff like that. But, you know, Blockchain Association is hardcore sometimes on this stuff. They, I mean, I'm sure it wasn't easy to uh, ally everybody to do an amicus brief in support of the Tornado Cash guys in a criminal money laundering case, but they did it. God bless them, they did it. And we have an ally in, in Tom Emmer. The number three guy in the house is for privacy. And he says this slogan right here, privacy is normal. It's in the congressional record from Tom Emmer. God bless him. Uh, so hopefully he can kill efforts to slip things into must-pass bills, and we need to cheer him on as a community. I think he he cares about what crypto community says about him on Twitter. So if you can, folks, if you can amplify my my Monero friends, amplify the alarm about the Enforce Act and why it's bad, and amplify that Tom Emmer is a hero for privacy. I think that would be good. Those would be good good takeaways from today. How about that, Doug? That's great. Any any other allies we can, we can we can name that uh, uh, other than Tom Emmer? I mean, he he's really the I guess the biggest one we have in Congress. I uh, I, I don't follow names as much as I used to. Warren Davidson is an ally, Representative Warren Davidson, and why am I blanking on this name right now? The congressman from uh, from Kentucky. Uh, oh, libertarian. Uh, yeah, libertarian congressman from Kentucky who's really close with uh, with 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 Senator Paul. 
Uh, they're good friends, and 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 he's kind of like Paul's counterpart in the house. Um, it'll come to me after. But Tom Massey, yeah, I'm Tom, Tom Massey, yeah, 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 Tom yeah, Massey. very, very, Thanks. very smart guy, very smart yeah, guy. Great. Um, the problem is, is it's it's a small group, it's right? Small group. And, and they're 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 looked at as you know being uh, the guys with the with the big crazy libertarian ideas. Yeah, but Emerson leadership, Emerson, he's number three in leadership, so that's good. That is promising. That is promising. Yeah. Any 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 thought? Obviously, this is the million Monero question. Any thoughts on how we we make it a more of a mainstream concern? Um, I mean, that we think about all that that all the time in Zcash too. Um, you know, and and we just focus on on use cases. When we find use cases, we know people who use Zcash for humanitarian uh, issues. Um, humanitarian relief uh in the middle east and in asia and so we talk about those use cases anytime we can we talk about the threats to privacy we talk about wrench attacks uh there's a collection of wrench attack stories on github that there's like 150 of those things uh just these terrible stories about i was at a crypto conference I was walking around uh, the back streets. I got hit in the head. I woke up. I was in a warehouse, and there was a guy saying, give me your seat phrase, or else parts start coming off. You know, shit like that. It's real. It happens. Um, I mean, you start telling those stories to people. I tried to do it in front of the jury in that in the Sterling Oak case. In that environment, the judge constrains every little word you say. So I, I couldn't do much, but the little bit I did, you could see in their eyes, they were like, oh, okay, maybe privacy is not evil. And I've done congressional briefings with bipartisan groups of congressional staffers. And when I start doing my thing, even the Liz Warren allies look at me like, oh, uh, okay, okay. I hear a little bit of what you're saying. Um, so that stuff does resonate when you can get the message out and get get that message out over the noise of the, on the one hand, the Liz Warrenites, on the other hand, the national security Republican kind of bushy, uh, 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 Patriot Act type people. Um, they're pretty loud, but but I think our voice can get heard too if we keep at it. We can have natural allies too. You know, libertarians and ACLU coming together. This is one issue I think where they can. Coin Center's doing a great job. Uh, yeah. Do you, oh yeah. Do you think? Do you think we need? Somebody, you know, something else like some other kind of uh, association that's really just geared towards privacy coins. Um, that would I mean, be we'll, awesome. What is the closest awesome. thing we have? I mean, we we need we need people out there that are organizing and right. Well, right. I mean, how, how would you yeah. en- envision this? Uh, yeah. You know, we in Zcash, we 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 put together and we love more people involved. I think Paul Brigner, who's a policy the policy lead for the electric coin company, is involved with um a privacy alliance, the Universal Privacy Alliance. The people from NIM are part of that. NIM is uh, kind of a um I don't I don't understand NIM fully technically. It's like Tor but uh-huh. has a different process from Tor to anonymize your... Yeah, we, we have them at Mon- Monerotopia. Yeah, yeah, they're, a, they're great. They're great. So there's the private alliance of, of some of the usual suspects. If folks in Monero community want to join that, I'm sure Paul Brigner would welcome you know more more supporters in that thing. Um, so that's, that's who's, who's running this? Paul Brigner? Paul Brigner is the policy lead for Electric Coin Company. Okay. And, and so, also, you know, he also does a, uh, he does a, um, something called a PGP breakfast, a morning breakfast every month for people in DC for just general crypto, but there are probably some people who come and I'm sure it'd be great to have somebody from the mirror community join remotely and present over zoom to, to that group. I'm sure, I'm sure that would be, I'm inviting for his behalf for his thing, but he's very open. So no, uh, I'm sure we could find a way to make that work. Yeah, we 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 de- there needs to be more collaboration here among yes. uh, among these these groups. I mean, because we're we're s- collectively we're 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 a small bunch. Monero um, and Zcash are in the foxhole together, so let's share provisions. Absolutely, man. One one hundred percent. We got to get Zcash down at Monerotopia. You get yeah, you got to help me help 
help me make that happen. I mean, maybe we could get Paul Paul down there, or you yep. know, a, a, anybody. I mean, um, it would it would be great, even you know, from the from the technology side or from the policy side. Uh, it it does lead me to another question, though, right? Because we, we're talking about the the layer ones kind of being the the ultimate uh, safe ground, right? Because if they're banning these, then it's a real in in you know infraction against the, our constitutional rights, right? The code yeah. is no longer speech. Um, but the concern is, you know, with with things like Z, Zcash has. Uh, ha- has the company right that potentially can be a target? Um, they have the, the the dev tax. Are they getting rid of that? Did I see that that that's no longer? Give give me your latest thoughts on, on these things and whether or not um, you see them as potential issues. And if, is is Zcash doing things to av- avoid these you know potential issues? Well, um, so I see some analogies between. Zcash and Ethereum and Bitcoin. So Bitcoin had its core developers. Ethereum had the Ethereum Foundation. Zcash has the Electric Coin Company, and and then later came the Zcash Foundation to fund the more theoretical crypt- cryptography stuff. Um, you know, it, when people built smart contract uh, privacy tools on top of Ethereum. Or people came in al- along and built mixers on top of Bitcoin. At no point were the Bitcoin core devs charged with anything or implicated, or was that even asserted? Same thing for the Ethereum Foundation because they didn't coordinate with whoever was building the alleged money transmitter on top of that protocol. So I don't have any concerns that uh, Zcash Foundation or ECC are gonna are gonna are gonna face any 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 accusation that they were involved in the operational money transmitter or money laundering in the same way because they're just building a layer one protocol that allows for tra- for individual transfers um in the same way that that the other two layer ones were built uh where where everything goes forward i don't know man that, that, there's a there's a strong debate going on so we'll see how that shakes out kind of a decent what is the community what is the debate versus- uh, whether to continue the dev tax or not, uh, whether to continue the founder's reward is what it's called or not, uh, whether to instead move toward a different model. Um, I don't, I don't know how that's going to all shake out and, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, cause the, the, the founder's reward slash uh, dev tax, it does given what we've seen, right. With the, with the, the what, the 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 indictment of samurai and all these things, and what what would they come on would come down on is the fact that there's a group of people that are benefiting right that are profiting from from this technology right and it becomes the the whole conspiracy again right uh, you have this group of people that are profiting from essentially from the from the use of this system uh, and and over here we're proving that. There's bad guys that sometimes use this system to to launder their money. Yeah. Well, um, one thing that helps Zcash right now is that that bad guys don't like Zcash. Bad guys, yeah. <laughs> right? So, I mean, that's we had a Rand Institute study that 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 said that uh, dark web doesn't use Zcash. Um, now, if that changes one day in the future, I still don't think that makes us um, intending to, to 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 conspire together. With the- don't don't give me wrong. I, I I obviously would would never would never yeah. think that. I I don't I don't think that's the you know obviously that they're wrong yeah. with samurai. They're wrong with tornado cash. But the fact is, this is the direction they're moving in. So a- any 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 tech that exists where there's yeah. then a group of people that they can say are the people that control it, or even if they don't control it, they somehow benefit from it financially. They're saying, okay, these people. Uh, are are conspiring to run a money transmitting business or conspiring to money launder? That's that's literally what they're saying right now, right? Right. But the difference is that we um, people who are transferring are transferring from their own private wallets to other private wallets, right? There's no stop in the middle mm. uh, that takes custody of it and does something with it. Um, it's all it's all individual wallet to wallet transfers, which is not money transmission. Um, 
which is somewhat but, similar to to samurai to samurai i mean i guess they they did have that that server but they were never custodying anybody's crypto they never they were never held. custodying anybody's crypto they had a central coordinator uh that signed transactions um for people right yeah it's just not a stretch. I don't know. I don't know. It's it's scary. It's scary how once you once you once you if the government's allowed to just 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 say that anything is anything, if that's really what happens, then anything is anything, and therefore there's no limiting fun, limiting factor. Um, and, and 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 in that case, they could say, you know, the creator of Bitcoin was in a conspiracy to commit money laundering because in the early days of Bitcoin, most Bitcoin transfers were illicit transfers. Right, um, and in, in 2012, if Satoshi were not anonymized, maybe some prosecutor would have tried it to try to take down Silk Road. I don't know, man. Um, yeah, I mean that, that's when Satoshi left the scene, right? Is right, and uh, they started right. talking to the to the CIA, right? And now, and now BlackRock has an ETF for Bitcoin. <laughs> so it's a weird world. I don't know, man. I don't know. Give, 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 give us some hope, though. Give us some um, some hope. I mean, obviously, you're hopeful. Obviously, I'm hopeful. I wouldn't be here doing this thing. You wouldn't be yeah. doing what you're doing. What's what's your hopeful pitch to people? Uh, that privacy is pro-national security. Uh, the best way we can get... Um, you know, I, I don't know why the CIA doesn't use Monero and Zcash to pay agents. Right? Why not? Why not? Maybe they do. Maybe they do. Maybe they should, uh, or maybe they do. Um, and I don't know why uh, the UN is the UN starting to use stable coins to try to pay refugees, get money to refugees, uh, which is great until until the bad guys who hate the refugees start tracing those funds. Um, I think the UN should be using privacy coins to pay refugees, and then the refugees can go unload them on central exchanges that have liquidity unless those get delisted which is the problem in Europe um yeah so maybe we can make that make that make that known that privacy is pro national security you think that that's that's kind of the the best uh one of the best arguments we have i'm trying <laughs> I'm trying to <laughs> well you're you're doing a good job, man. Uh, you know, I think we're we're all we're all trying out here. I mean, uh, what, what what do you think of this? You know, the the idea that te- technology like like Monero and Zcash, um, just needs needs to be built essentially to be unstoppable. So, in spite of what the governments may want to do, it won't matter. We just build something that can't be stopped and people will just continue to use it uh not comply or do you think that's a bit of a pipe dream um and that it's going to be you know the reality is that most people will will comply and they'll they'll you know the the, the, the chilling effect will will dampen things out um so first let me say something so when you say that, right, let's make sure we the world understands what we mean by what you're saying. That we won't we, we want to make build tech that that that's unstoppable by a government. When we say government, we don't mean the US government prosecuting cases against truly bad guys. What we mean is around the world totalitarian governments all around the world that uh use money to persecute people. That's what we mean. Because I watched in Sterling off, they they used similar language against him, and they said, "See, he he had an intent to help criminals who want to uh, want to sell drugs." But that's not what that language means, really. That language means totalitarian governments around the world, Russia, China, Venezuela, North Korea, who use money to persecute and hurt people. And so we want to build technology in both of our communities that is resistant to the effort to use money to persecute and hurt people. Or Argentina, where people have to just eat the inflation and capital controls stop them from saving their money in something other than the Argentinian peso. Um, And yes, we have to build in that way. I think we can. And I think there's, uh, you know, 
crypto community generally, there's a kind of a a goal of kind of winning the Uber way. You know, when Uber first started, it was like illegal most of the places it was being used, but people cared about it so much. They were like, don't, t- don't you dare take my Uber from me. Um, that the political fight became so much easier just because of that groundswell of user, uh, user, you know, demand. Um, so if we win, I think we'll win that way. All right, man. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm checking my notes here to see if there's any anything else I wanted to, to bring up with you today. Um, oh, I was I was looking back at our interview the the book yeah. that you had written hiding hiding your hiding your money. Um, yeah, that came up in the trial too. <laughs> <laughs> that that title. Yeah, uh, so, they loved it. They loved it. <laughs> uh, what did they say about that during the trial? Uh, they said, is it true you're working on a book about how to, and then he looks at the jury, hide money using crypto. <laughs> and I was like, yes, absolutely. I'm working on a book that teaches people how to protect themselves from wrench attacks, how to protect themselves from North Korean hackers, and that that focuses on the tension between forensics and privacy that is inherent to this community you know i just and the jury got it i think it's a cheap trick uh these two prosecutors did a lot of cheap tricks um but the jury understood it the status is uh it's been under peer review for a while i'm gonna have to adjust it in a lot of ways i had a chapter about samurai wallet and obviously that chapter is gonna gonna be different now than it was before uh, basically by focus i want to write about zcash monero and samurai wallet because i thought there was were the three best privacy tools out there now there's two. Now there's two, you know. Wow, things. Uh, when do you when do you think the book will come out? It's gonna be a while. It's an academic book, so it'll take a while. Okay. Very cool that you're working on. Anything else you want to bring up while you while you have the platform here, the audience? Um. Yeah, you know, I just I appreciate the Monero community. Appreciate you guys, and I, I appreciate um, what I learned from. From from your show, man. Uh, I got it to the Sterling Love case from your show, and appreciate uh, learning from from guys like Luke, uh, who who keep everybody honest and who are building for the right reasons. And uh, let's keep let's keep the keep the lines of communication open about the threat about the threat vectors coming our way. People that are like sitting on the edge of their seat here saying they, you know, thinking that, that they can help in some way, maybe their attorneys, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, what, what do you recommend they, they, they do to, to try to help, to try to advocate on behalf of Monero, Zcash? Amplify Tom Nimmer as a real hero for, pri- for privacy. Raise the alarm about the Enforce Act and what special measures authority could do to destroy privacy coins. Um, you know, I know Tor and Mike are fundraising for the appeal for Roma Sterlingoff on their law firm's webpage, and they've appreciated a lot of support from the privacy and Bitcoin communities for that. Uh, that's a way to get started. And otherwise, I'm Block Prof on Twitter. I'd love to interact with y'all more. And uh, thanks for this opportunity, man. I love coming on here. So I'll, I'll, I'll join you anytime you want, man. JW man, thank you so much. Uh, I hope I hope we see you down in Monerotopia. We get yeah, some some Zcash people down there. That yeah. that would be fantastic. That'd be awesome, man. All right, buddy. Thank you so much. Cheers. All right, wait. Hold Cheers. on one second. Hold on one second.